uh, I wanted to talk a little about, a little about my personal history. Um, my grandfather uh, was a Swiss immigrant, um, you know, really a total stereotype, a, a watchmaker um, from Bern, um, who came to the United States um, and worked in Hollywood, as one did in those, in those days, because Hollywood was a very mechanical business with lots of gears and, and uh, film transports, um, sound recording mechanisms. So he worked as, you know, Hollywood was like gears and watches were like gears, and that was a good fit. And, and then at home, he had a little workshop in his garage. Um, and uh, as a child, I would go and spend my summers with him. And um, uh, he didn't talk much, but he could do amazing things with the metal lathe. And the curlicues would pile up and uh, splock them in. And the way, same way a sculptor takes a block of, 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 of marble and chips away the bits that aren't the person, he would take a block of steel and sort of, you know, sort of machine away the parts that weren't a four-stroke engine. And it was extraordinary to, to watch. And, um, and the, while I was there, he invented the automatic sprinkler system. Um, so, uh, you know. That was the source of my family's very modest fortune. Um, but in those days, um, if you invented something awesome, like the automatic sprinkler system, um, the only way to get to market was to patent it and then to license the patent to a company who would, you know, many, uh, a factory, who would then um, basically do their own thing. They would, um, uh, you know, you'd lost the control of your technology. Um, you might get ripped off in terms of the economics, but that was just the way to do it. There was no way for an individual to get to market without going through a big company. What's interesting today is if you is if you if, if he were to invent this equivalent today, um, as 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 I'll explain in a minute, I am I, I do and people like me do. Um, you don't need to patent and license. You would make it yourself. He would, he would go to Alibaba. He would have the the parts uh, manufactured. They'd be assembled by another company. They'd be drop shipped, and you know he would have not been an inventor. He'd be an entrepreneur, um, and he would have maintained control and economics and all that sort of thing. <laughs> It would have been a very different and, and probably superior process. The picture here I'm showing you is a, is a screenshot from a movie called Flash of Genius, which is a, um, a movie about the invention of the intermittent windshield wiper. Um, and uh, those of you, you know, everything was once had to be invented once, and there was once a time when windshield wipers went But, you know, whether it was raining hard or, 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 or not. Um, and and uh, a, a guy um, in his basement invented a little timer circuit that went and could, and could pause. Um, and um, he then decided uh, that he wanted to go from inventor to entrepreneur. And uh, he made a huge mistake, which is that he wanted to, he wanted to, to own his own, his own destiny. He wanted to maintain control. The only way he could do that is to create his own factory. And so he mortgages his, he gets a second mortgage on his house, he rents space, he starts the assembling of a factory, you know, forklifts, assembly lines, all this kind of stuff, years go by, you know, second year, third year. Um, uh, you know, after the fourth year, um, this factory's still not done, he's mortgaged to the hilt, it's a rainy day, he walks out of his factory to go home. The 1964 uh, Chevy um, um, uh, Mustangs, uh, Ford Mustangs rather, are, are turning the corner to be unveiled um, at the big press conference in the rain and their windshield wipers go whoosh, whoosh, and he realizes that his idea has been stolen, he is ruined, bankrupt, he goes crazy and the movie then proceeds very entertainingly on. Uh, the good news, by the way, is in real life, in, in real life he, um, uh, you know, uh, almost 20 years later, he successfully sued for patent infringement, um, but uh, um, at any rate, it was a bad two decades for this, for this man because he, he didn't have, because in those days, to manufacture, you needed to have a factory. Um, that is no longer true. Today, obviously, same deal. Just like my grandfather might if he were born today, you invent the intermittent windshield wiper, you then sort of say, okay, well, what are the components? We've got a printed circuit board, we've got a motor, we've got some gears, we've got some standard wiper um, structures. Who makes that? Can they make it for me? Can they customize this bit? Can they package it? Can they drop ship it? And he would have been in business and selling to GM before GM could if they so wanted, rip them off, rip them off. It would have been, he would have just, his, 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 his smallness would have been an asset, not a liability, because he could get to market more quickly, because he didn't have to build the factory. And therein is the internet of things. Um, this is what he would have avoided. Um, today, uh, there are, um, there's a proliferation of these emerging sort of um, you know, micro manufacturing spaces. This is just off the street in San Mateo. This is Tech Shop. Um, and uh, for uh, basically a, a gym model. Um, so for a gym membership cost, I believe it's $100 a month, you become a member of Tech Shop. And all these acts and all the access to the tools of production the, the laser cutters, the plasma cutters, the CNC machines, the, you know, the electronics, um, you know, the, the hot reflow ovens, all that kind of stuff was all there. Um, and these people are all micro 
micro manufacturing entrepreneurs. Um, uh, I believe this gentleman right there is, is, uh, is making a, um, a vapor deposition diamond um, um, uh, manufacturing system. Um, these guys here are working on a smart grid um, uh, electronic um, elements. Um, they actually make it here, the two guys uh, make their sort of smart grid monitoring um, technology um, here, um, and they put the label ABB on it because they're actually um, selling to ABB, who then sells it to their customers. ABB is a huge Swedish defense, uh, sorry, um, 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 uh, contractor. And uh, you know, who knows, you buy this from ABB, you have no idea it's made by two dudes um, at Tech Shop, um, and so on. Um, and and you know, this, this should be of no surprise, right? I mean, Silicon Valley was born in garages by people like, you know, like Bill Hewitt and Dave Packard. And um, you know, this, this notion that if you unlock the potential of innovation and ideas and, and the individual working in their garage, if you find a way for them to get to market, you can change the world, is the root of everything that's around us. Um, but that's largely only applied in, in certain sectors. We now have the uh, poss potential to apply that across the board. Um, to, test, to test, if this is an industrial revolution, it has to scale. It has to, it has to really move the needle in terms of job creation, in terms of um, economic power. Um, the right test of any industrial model is cars. If it doesn't work for cars, it probably isn't an industrial revolution. So uh, uh, here is the world's first open source car. It is the, um, the rally fighter made by local motors. Um, what's open source about it? What does it mean to be an open source car? Um, it's quite interesting to, 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 to understand um, you know, the potential for revolution within the car industry. Um, there has always been an industry called the kit car industry, which is basically off-the-shelf components and welded steel frames. Uh, they're largely models of famous cars, you know, MGs and things and things, things like that. Um, the kit car industry has never gotten more than 10,000 units a year because they're constantly being sued for trademark infringements and things. Because they are, these kit cars are essentially you know, models of famous cars, they are derivative designs. And um, licensing becomes a huge issue. Um, the problem was not the car. The problem was the appearance of the car. The problem was the intellectual property in, 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 in its exterior. So the bit they decided to open source was the exterior. So this here is a, the challenge was to a uh, design community to design a cool rally car, an off-road rally car. And, and um, one of the suggestions was that, that you, you sort of take inspiration from a non-car, in this case, the P-51 Mustang. And uh, so, it's, so a, a team of, of, of several hundred um, uh, car geeks, for lack of a better word, um, all with a very good collaboration system, sort of went to work. And, and the winning design um, was this one. And when I say winning design, of course, this is sort of an a, a overall design. But within the design, there are, much, there are many little designs, you know, this bit and this bit and this bit and that curve and this dimension. And, this, and, and so what happens is after they got the, sort of the winning design, then everybody went to work. Rather than sort of say, oh, well, I lost. I'm through. They sort of said, OK what's the next bit that needs my help? I didn't win the overall car design, but my design can, can win for the uh, rear view mirror, for the exhaust pipe, et cetera. So people kept having something to do. Now, who are these people? Um, it turns out that, um, that uh, most car designers in t today come from a place called Art Center, the Art Center in Pasadena, which is a kind of a, a, a university that teaches industrial design. Um, uh, for every 100 people that graduate from the, uh, the Art Center, um, in car design, only 20 get a job in the car industry. So you have 80%, sorry, so 80 percent of their graduating class is disappointed, frustrated, and un unable to follow their dream. Um, so they went off to do industrial design of something else, chairs or, 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 or coffee tables. Um, but they still love cars. They still have the skills. They still have the desire. And um, by day, they're designing coffee tables. By night, they're on this site designing cars because you, because because there was a, because we have latent energy out there, we have cognitive surplus, we have skills that are not being tapped um, by people's day jobs, and these people were delighted to be able to do to follow their dream and design a car. Um, that's the exterior. The interior is exactly like the traditional kit cars. It's a welded steel frame done by a kit car company, and all the other parts are off the shelf. The engine comes from BMW. The transmission, I think, also BMW. You've got, um, I think, this comes. I think the rearview mirror actually comes from a Corolla. You know, every other bit can be bought off the shelf. Um, and you know, you don't know this, but it's but it's, it's true of many industries that the components, that the sort of the, the diversification of the supply chain means that these 
parts makers are not just selling to the big companies, they're also willing to sell to the secondary markets, the repair markets, and the, and, and the amateur markets. The pricing may not be the same, but you have access to all the parts you need.